Hello everyone, my name is Haley Elizabeth and if you don't know who I am, this is my podcast called Behind You where once a week I sit down and I talk about all things true crime ranging from murder, cults, disappearances, all the way to the biggest drug bust in history, the biggest bank heist in history, all things true crime. So if you're interested in any of that, you can go to the YouTube channel Haley Elizabeth and watch the visual version every Wednesday or you could head over to Spotify, Apple, wherever you can find podcasts for the audio version version every Tuesday. And in today's case, we are going to be talking about the case of Tia Sharp. Now, there is a lot to get through, so let's just hop right into it. Tia Christine Sharp was born on June 30th of 2000 in Croydon, London. She grew up with her mom, Natalie, and her father, Stephen. Now, Natalie had Tia when she was quite young, and so because of this, the father, Stephen, just kind of went his separate way and and Natalie went her separate way, so she didn't really have much connection with her birth father growing up, but Natalie did get help from her mother, so Tia's grandmother, named Kristen, and it was the two of them that really raised Tia. And so growing up, it was always Tia, her mom Natalie, and her grandmother Christine, and the three of them were best friends. They always hung out with each other, they went to the store with one another, and Tia was described to be just a very bubbly child. She was very high spirited and her mom says that whenever you looked at Tia, she was either always laughing or singing or dancing or telling jokes. She was just the type of kid that was very unable to sit still because there was always like a hundred other things that she really wanted to do. And this also flowed into her school as well. In school, she had lots of friends and she was very confident in herself. And again, since because of her confident nature and just getting along with everyone, she made friends quite easily. And in school, her teachers would also say that Tia was just such a joy to have in class. She was always, you know, the class clown, really. Like, she was always cracking jokes. She was always laughing. And on top of all of that, Tia got really good grades as well. So, not only was she super outgoing and, like, friends with everyone, she was also really smart, too. But taking it back a little bit to 2003 when Tia was three years old, that is when Natalie Sharp had met a man by the name of Stuart Hazel. Now, a little bit of backstory on Stuart Hazel. Stuart was born on May 26th of 1975 in Kingston-upon-Thames, London. So, growing up, Stuart's mom was actually a sex worker, and because of this, uh, she was never really home very often, and when she was home, she would have to kick Stuart out of the house so she could do her services, and because of this, it just developed a really rocky relationship between Stuart and his mother. He never really saw her or spoke to her that often and same thing with his father his father was always in and out of prison so growing up he never really had anyone around him anyone that was like a good role model to him or someone that he could look up to and aspire to be his mother was also very abusive when they would spend time together it was said that every time they were you know spending time with one another she was always yelling at him or telling him what a terrible son he was and how he is the reason why she has to go out and be a sex worker because she needs to provide for him. So overall, it was just a really bad situation for everyone. And so, because of this, at a very young age, he was actually put into foster care. Whilst he was in foster care, um, all of these things that, you know, had happened to him between his mom and his dad, he was just starting to feel a lot of things that he didn't want to feel. So, at just 13 years old, that is when he started to abuse drugs and alcohol. And then at 14 years old, he got arrested for the very first time for disorderly behavior and continued to get arrested for things such as racially aggravated assault, dealing cocaine, possessing a machete in a public place, and so many other things. And then when he was 16 years old, he ran away from his foster home and he went to go live in a homeless shelter in Soho, London. And it was said by Stewart that at this homeless shelter, 
shelter, he was actually being sexually assaulted by an old man there constantly. So because of all of these traumatic things that he's going through and he has no one in his life to look up to, he doesn't know what direction to go. Instead, he just kind of does what feels safe to him and just pursue being on his own and pursuing a life of crime. And then at 28 years old in 2003, that is when he met Natalia Sharp. So this relationship only lasted about two and a half weeks because Stuart and Natalia were two completely different people. They just didn't, they just never saw eye to eye. They were constantly arguing and so because of this they had split. But Stuart would never actually leave the family because a couple years later that is when he started up a relationship with Natalie's mother Kristen aka Tia's grandmother. So the both of them started dating. I believe there was a 10 to 20 year age gap between the two. And then in 2007, four years into their relationship, that is when he moved into her new Addington home when he was 32 years old. At the time, Tia was seven years old and would frequently go to her grandmother Kristen's house. And since, you know, Stuart lived there, she would also see Stuart all the time. And Tia absolutely adored Stuart. They got along very, very well. She would frequently call him granddad and she just loved to be over there. She loved to play with her grandparents and have fun. And the reason why she also grew very close with Stuart is because since she didn't have a father growing up or any sort of male figure, it was mostly just her mother and her grandmother, Stuart was the very first male figure in her life. So naturally, she kind of looked up to him as both a father and a grandfather. But similar to Stuart's father, Stuart was in and out of jail constantly, so he couldn't really hold a job until he decided to, you know, just settle down and get a actual job. So that is when he got a job as a window cleaner. And then on August 2nd of 2012, when Tia was 12 years old, that is when she went to her grandparents' house, so Stuart and Christine's house, to spend the night on Thursday. And then the next morning on Friday, she would take the train home to Croydon, and she was supposed to return back home in Croydon by 7 p.m. So she ends up leaving. She goes to her grandparents' house on Thursday. Her mom, Natalia, drops her off. Everything is fine. And then the next day on Friday, Natalia's at home and it then becomes 7 p.m. and then 8 p.m. and then 9 and then into the next morning and Tia still isn't back. And so then the next day, Saturday, around 6 p.m., so like early evening, that is when she started to get very, very concerned as to where Tia was. Natalia at first just kind of assumes that maybe she spent another day at her grandparents' house, but the fact that she had been gone for 24 hours and nothing from Tia... Natalia also tried to call Tia's phone, but there was no answer, so that is when she called her mother, Christine, to ask her, hey, is Tia with you? When is, you know, when is she coming home? And that is when Christine said that Tia had actually left on Friday morning to go back to Croydon. So that is when Tia started to really get very scared because she said, you know, Tia hasn't been home since Thursday night. What are you talking about? She went on the train on Friday morning and Kristen's like yeah she went on the train Friday morning that's what Stuart told me and she went home is she not home so then on August 5th of 2012 that following day on Sunday that is when Natalia called the police and tried to file a missing persons report and since Tia had been missing for over 48 hours at this point she was declared as a missing person So the whole entire town just basically, you know, all hands on deck. They were making shirts, they were making flyers, they were passing out flyers, they were hanging, you know, these posters up all over the place for someone to try and find Tia. There was also a team of detectives who were on the case that were trying to look for Tia, as well as media outlets talking on the news, trying to spread the awareness of Tia's disappearance. And if anyone has seen her, please come forward. 
So then the next day on Monday, August 6th of 2012, Tia's family came forward with a statement about the disappearance, hopefully talking to her kidnapper, saying, please just bring her back home. Tia, if you're listening to this, just come back home. And as the police are trying to piece together what actually happened, and so then that is when the police decide to talk to the very last people that saw Tia, and that was Christine and Stuart. What the police found, however, is is that when they were having their interview with Christine, Christine actually told the police that she wasn't home on Friday morning or Thursday night. I couldn't really find out where exactly she was, but she said that she was not home that night, and the one who was actually watching Tia was 37-year-old Stuart Hazel. So once the police heard this, that Stuart was the last person to see Tia, and now Tia is missing, they become a little bit skeptical of Stuart naturally, but they also try to give him the benefit of the doubt and try to come up with a bunch of theories. They theorize that since uh, Stuart and Christine's house was on like the countryside of London, so there was a bunch of like wooded areas and cornfields around them, they're assuming that maybe Stuart just kind of let Tia go into the backyard and play in the fields and then Tia got lost and didn't know how to find her way back home or possibly Tia went out into the fields and she got abducted in the fields. Maybe she was hanging out with friends and then on her way home she got abducted. So they're coming up with a conclusion that she is either abducted or still alive somewhere in New Addington. So that is when the police go out and they try to search the woods as well as a bunch of civilian volunteers. Everyone's trying to figure out where Tia is. And during the entire search for Tia, uh, when the family was doing, you know, press conferences and handing out flyers and making all these shirts, Stuart's behavior the entire time was completely fine, you know, although he did look like a main suspect, Stuart kept on saying, you know, I love Tia. There is no way that I would do something like this. That would be disgusting of me. Like, if something did happen, I'm a man, so I would, you know, come up and confess to my crimes if I did something like this, but I didn't. And even when he gave statements, hosted memorials, handed out posters, he looked very distressed dressed and disheveled as if he was losing sleep over it. And so that is when the police nonetheless decided to do a little bit of digging onto Stuart and what they found was his very lengthy criminal record and what they also found was that Stuart wasn't even related to Tia. He wasn't her grandfather, he was her step grandfather. So there would be no blood connection between the two. And because of this, the police Police started to suspect Stuart a lot more and brought him in for just a couple of questions since he was the last person to see her. So when he was brought into questioning, he had very little to contribute and when it came to his story, he was very vague on most parts but very detailed on odd parts. So he said that him and Tia had a very happy Thursday evening together and then the next morning he made breakfast and Tia said that she was going to go meet a friend in Croydon so she was going to get on the train that morning a little bit earlier. Stuart then took her to the station. Stuart then said bye to her because Tia was off to walk to the train station that was only down the street by the way. Like when I was reading this I was like they're just letting their 12 year old walk to the train station by themselves but it was literally right down the street and the train that she did go on wasn't like super packed it was equivalent to a public bus but shortly after this the police actually looked at the security footage and found that Tia never went on the train that morning so something must have happened from the time that Tia left the house to on her way to the train station and something that they noticed about Stuart's story was very odd because 
usually, you know, when you're telling a story to someone, it's just kind of the basic facts. But in this case, Stuart was getting very detailed for no reason. And he does this again later on. So I'll talk more in depth on it when we get to that part. But after they hear this story from Stuart, they want a search warrant for the home. So they get a search warrant to search Christine and Stuart's home because this was the last place that Tia was definitely seen. And when investigating the home the first time around, they found nothing of significance except for Tia's phone. Tia's phone was a very big piece of evidence because from Stuart's statement, he said that Tia said that she was on her way to meet a friend in Croydon and it would be very hard for you to meet up with a friend if you don't have your phone on you. And especially if her mom was trying to contact her or she wanted to contact her mom, she would have no phone with her. And this was very odd because Tia was a 12-year-old girl. You know, usually teenagers, they need their phone. They, they're they always on their phone. They always need their phone. And it would be very odd that Tia, you know, even just halfway down her walk would realize that her phone wasn't on her. So then she would turn around and go grab it and then continue walking to the station. So this was very odd for police to find. And then on August 7th of 2012, five days after Tia's disappearance, that is when they started to get over 50 different witness statements from people claiming that they saw Tia on Thursday and Friday. And one of these witness statements was from a cashier at a local supermarket. And so the police looked into the security footage of that day at this local supermarket. And what do you know, right on the security footage, footage into the store walks in Stuart with 12 year old Tia. So this security footage was found and released to the public and this was a very big tell sign that Stuart was lying because there would be no way that him and Tia could go to the grocery store on Friday morning. That's a pretty big detail. You would probably tell the police that but for some reason Stuart specifically left that out of his statement for a reason. And in the security footage, it shows Stuart and Tia walking around the store. Tia looks to be holding an overnight bag in her hand as if she was under the impression or planning to go home after the supermarket trip. Tia in the footage also looks very relaxed and calm. She doesn't seem very intimidated or scared by Stuart. And this is probably one of the most saddest parts about all of it is in this footage you can really see that Tia trusted Stuart. This was a guy that she, you know, really looked up to. This guy was family to her and so it's just really sad to see how close and vulnerable she was. Now, when it was released, the security footage, everyone started freaking out because this was, again, a very big piece of evidence that Stuart was lying and the media also knew that he was lying in his statements as well. Tia's family's reaction to all of this was surprising surprisingly very negative. They thought that the media was just making it out to be something it wasn't. They kept on saying, you know, you got it all wrong. Stuart would never do this. Stop painting him as the bad guy. He's a really, really good person. And they also didn't like that the media was making Stuart out to be this terrible person because they continuously said that Stuart cared a lot for Tia. And Stuart also said this himself. He said that he cared a lot for Tia. And then on August 8th of 2012, that is when the police got a statement from a neighbor because at this point, the police, as I said, they were trying to get witness statements from Tia's like route or the route that she would have taken to the train station. And there was a particular neighbor, the next door neighbor, that said that he saw Tia leave on Friday morning to Croydon and that was the morning that she disappeared. Exactly what? Stewart said. Stewart said that on Friday morning, Tia left to go to the train station, and now this neighbor is saying that 
that he saw Tia actually leave to go to the train station that morning. And this statement really confused police and they didn't really know what to think anymore because now that they have a witness statement saying that they saw Tia after, you know, Stuart had already left her, they had just so many more questions now because they were like, okay, well, did Stuart take her to the store and then bring her back to the house and then Tia went to the train station? Were they thinking too much of Stuart? Stuart? Is Stuart actually innocent? Is there another party involved? And they just started thinking, you know, what if Tia actually did go by herself? Or is there something that's staring right at them that they're not noticing? They ended up getting a search warrant to search the house a second time, but this time around they brought sniffer dogs and they said that although there was no physical evidence found in the house, they noted that one of the dogs acted very unusual in a particular room of the house, sniffing specifically the floors and the walls as if something was in the floors and the walls. So that is when the police decided to clear out the house and do a first forensic search of the house. So in order for them to do a forensic search, that means the whole family would have to up and move out of the house so they could do so. So they asked the family to move out of the house for a couple of days while forensic team came in and basically just tore the house apart trying to look for something. And by this day on August 8th, the police had received over 50 witness statements from people who saw Tia on Thursday and Friday. August 9th of 2012, the very next day, Tia at this point had been missing for almost a week and that is when they transitioned this missing persons case to a murder case. And so with this transition of the case, the media already was pointing fingers at Stewart saying that he had something to do with it. And now they were pointing fingers at Stewart saying that he killed Tia. And so since all of these things were being said about Stewart in the media, that is when Stewart agreed to do an interview with a TV station called ITV News and to tell his side of the story. The interviewer named Mark Williams said that Stewart Stuart in the beginning looked very nervous and fidgety, but Mark's pure intention of this interview was to just get a simple story of what happened that day from the second he first saw Tia to the last time he saw Tia. And Mark basically just asked him questions and however Stuart wanted to answer, he could answer. And by doing this, it was a very good idea for him to do this because he knew that this interview was most likely going to be reviewed by police and detectives. And so he just kind of let Stuart say whatever he wanted and just let him talk and that is exactly what happened. A body language expert by the name of Robert Phipps was on the case and he watched the interview and broke down the video and found a couple of odd things about Stewart's behavior throughout this interview. He noted that Stewart's body language doesn't seem very natural but more animated and rehearsed as if he's trying to do movements or do specific things that he feels like he should be doing. He was also shrugging his shoulders a lot as to say, I don't know, even though at that point he had been giving truthful statements. And as the interview continued, Mark Williams would call back to previous questions and just to see if, you know, his statement or his story would be the same as before. But what he realized is that every time he would call back to an old question but rephrase it differently, he became very flustered and he stuttered a lot as if he was unable to remember what he just said. The body language expert said that usually whenever you're telling a story to someone, you always tell them the highlights. So for example, if you're hanging out with a friend and your friend asks you, hey, what did you do yesterday? You would typically only reply with the highlights or the big bits of your day. So you would say something like, oh, yesterday um, I woke up, I got ready, and then I went to school, I did a bunch of schoolwork, and then after school I hung out with Jennifer, and then after I was done hanging out with Jennifer, that's when we did homework together, I went home, and you know, etc, etc. 
The leaves are falling and back to life feels are kicking in. Think fresh starts, new routines, and jam-packed to-do lists. Thankfully, Daily Harvest keeps me going with easy to prep food built on organic ingredients that I can actually feel good about. Daily Harvest delivers delicious harvest bowls, soups, flatbreads, and so much more built on organic fruits and vegetables. Daily Harvest worked directly with the farmers to source the best of the best ingredients, as well as freezing their ingredients at peak ripeness to lock in all the delicious nutrients and flavors. They never use artificial preservatives or artificial ingredients. Everything stays fresh in your freezer until you're ready to enjoy it, helping you reduce food waste at home. Their food is nourishing and easy to prep so I never have to think twice about what to eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, dessert. My personal favorite from Daily Harvest is the spinach flatbread. I absolutely love the spinach flatbread. It's so, so good and I think all of their nourishing options can help you really stay on track during those busy weekdays or nights. Daily Harvest is committed to human and planetary health, which means they do their absolute best to ensure transparency and integrity when it comes to their ingredients and the humans who grow them. And by supporting farmers who invest in practices that increase biodiversity and improve the health of our soil, and by delivering food in recyclable and compostable packaging where possible, Daily Harvest does the work so all I have to do is eat and enjoy. And you yourself deserve one less thing to worry about, so let Daily Harvest take care of all the fruits and veggies for you. Go to dailyharvest.com slash behind to get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash behind for up to $40 off your first box. So instead of, you know, giving the highlights using like my example from earlier saying, oh, what did you do yesterday? Instead of giving the highlights, he would say something like, oh, well, yesterday I woke up, I brushed my teeth, I brushed my hair, I got dressed, I ate cereal, I took these specific roads to drive to school, and then when I got to school, I went to math first period, we learned this, and then I went to biology, and we learned this. He was just getting way too specific for no reason, and what he was actually saying in the interview, like as far as specifics, he was saying that when him and Tia went to the store, he was giving giving the exact roads that he took to go to the store. Those roads are very insignificant to the story. There would be no reason why people need to know what roads he took. He also mentioned what he bought at the store. He was also mentioning what he cooked for Tia that morning for breakfast. And again, those are just all very small details that have no significance to the story. It seemed like he was just adding in details that aren't the truth, but they are specific in Enough to make people believe that it is the truth. The body language expert also uh, noted that typically in a human normal conversation, the average person blinks about 20 blinks per minute, but in this situation, Stewart was blinking about 40 to 45, which is extremely excessive, and it was a very big tell sign of him being nervous. The body language expert also noted uh, Stewart's surroundings during this entire interview. He noted that Stewart was not only wearing a t-shirt with Tia's missing poster on it, but he also had a printed out photo of Tia in the background as well as two missing persons posters of Tia. And from this, it just seemed like maybe Stewart was trying a little bit too hard. How can I be guilty? Look at me. I'm trying to find her too. And it just, it, It was just a very off-putting thing for the moment. It made it seem like he was just trying too hard to blend in, essentially. The body language experts also pointed out that during this interview, and this part I found to be very, very interesting because I didn't even know that this was a thing, but apparently he said that throughout the interview, Stuart tends to look away from the interviewer and down to his right side. So that means he's using the left side of his brain. 
so if you're looking at someone and they look to your right that is technically their left meaning they're using the left side of their brain and the left side of your brain has to do with constructing pictures and imagination and so vice versa if you are looking at someone and they look down to your left meaning that's their right they're using the right side of their brain so in this situation if Stuart was trying to tell the truth and he was genuinely trying to remember what was going on that day he would typically look off to his right and use the right side of his brain to try to remember those memories but instead he was looking off to the left inferring that he was using the left side of his brain and trying to construct pictures and imagination so this was a very tell sign of lying for the body language expert and that whole body language expert portion was very interesting in my opinion because it's very hard to you know lie in front of a body language expert because when you are doing things like looking off to your left or right or shrugging your shoulders or blinking too much those are all things that you're doing subconsciously and so since you are doing those things subconsciously and not consciously you're kind of just giving away that you're lying without even thinking that you're giving away that you're lying when you're trying to like lie to someone like that there's so many factors that you need to remember at once that it's just impossible to lie like that and so I don't know I just thought that portion was very very interesting so then on August 10th of 2012 that is when the police began their forensic search of Stuart and Christine's home on that same day, Christine told police that before they went in, there had been a bad smell coming from the house. She said that she didn't know what it was. She looked around the house and she couldn't find anything, but she was just letting them know in case it might be like mold or something, just so like they wear their masks or something, like just letting them know, like a little warning, there's something going on in there. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a health hazard, just letting you know now before you go in there. And so this would have been the fourth search of the house and when they walked in, the police definitely smelt the odd smell that Christine was smelling, except the police knew exactly what that smell was while Christine didn't. And the police knew as soon as they walked in that that smell was indeed a decomposing body. The forensic teams ended up doing a full search of the house and followed the smell all the way to the attic. They dropped down the attic door and inside of the attic, that is where they found the 12-year-old body of Tia Sharp wrapped up in black garbage bags. So at that point, it was very, very clear that Tia had never went to Croydon, but instead stayed at the house and from the autopsy, she had been decomposing for a week and that would be the same amount of time that she had been missing for. When the police had asked Kristen where Stuart was, still assumingly that Stuart was the one who created this crime, she said that Stuart had left this morning because he wanted to go grab a newspaper, but that was hours ago and he hasn't returned since. And since it doesn't take hours to get a newspaper, they then assumed that he was on the run somewhere. He probably knew that the police were coming in as a forensic team and they were going to find the body that was just lying clearly in the attic so that is when he decided to take a train all the way to central london and an attempt to run away from the police the police then saw from a uh, Stewart's train card that he was going to central London. They saw that he bought a ticket. So police were sent out to central London as well as the police in that area were told that a criminal was on the run and they should keep an eye out for him. Stewart, however, was located in central London in a local bodega where he was buying vodka. From the surveillance footage, you can see that he is very distressed, he's very drunk, and he's rambling about nonsense, and he's just mumbling under his breath and telling people, quote, 
you need to help me find my granddaughter, Tia. The owners of the bodega, since this story was such a big story right now with Tia and Stuart, they knew exactly who Stuart was as soon as he said that you need to help me find my granddaughter, Tia. So that is when the owners of the bodega immediately called the police. But unfortunately, the police did not show up in time because that is when Stuart had already left the bodega. They said that he they weren't sure where he went. They um they just knew like the direction of where he was going. So the police followed that direction and they ended up finding Stuart passed out in the middle of the park with a empty bottle of vodka in his hand. And so later that evening when he was able to sober up, that is when they arrested him for the murder of 12-year-old Tia Sharp. Shortly after this, the grandmother Christine was also arrested on suspicion of being an accomplice into the murder of Tia Sharp. And then on August 11th of 2012, although they had arrested Stewart, they still had no concrete evidence that he was the murderer. There is a big possibility that maybe Christine had done it or maybe he was being framed for this crime. So although they suspected it, they didn't have any real evidence like fingerprints or, you know, video footage, photo footage of him actually committing this crime. So after the police found Tia, that's when they did a very deep search of the attic. That is when they found Tia's clothing, all of her toys that she had brought to her grandfather's house, as well as her glasses, but her glasses were broken. Um, one of the lenses in her glasses was actually popped out, kind of indicating a very rough struggle of some kind. And at the top of the door frame, you know how there's a door frame, behind that door frame was actually found an SD card for a camera. So they brought the SD card to their tech team at the police station and at first they found no photos on it, but they were able to retrieve deleted photos from it. And on this SD card, there were a bunch of photos, all of naked underage girls that had the same haircut and glasses as Tia. So they weren't of Tia, but they were girls that looked very similar to her. And there was one photo on there as well that seemed like the location was at the home. So that means the picture was taken from whatever camera this was on. It was a dead girl lying on the floor with a bunch of black garbage bags lying on top of her. There was also a number of deleted videos found on the memory card, such as a video of Tia sleeping that Stuart had filmed with the flash on just basically walking around her bed before pointing the camera at the wall. So Sewer was standing at the end of Tia's bed and he pointed the camera with the flash on to his shadow that was on the wall next to them and kind of filmed himself at the edge of Tia's bed kind of looking over her very menacingly. And one of the most disturbing videos on this as well was just simply a one minute video of Tia sitting on the couch while rubbing sunscreen on her legs. And these two videos quite literally proved that this was indeed Stewart's SD card. This was something that he owned, meaning that he was in possession of all of those pictures of naked underage girls. Shortly after this, he was immediately arrested and charged for the murder of Tia. And while awaiting trial, Stewart actually wrote letters to his family back home, specifically this letter he had sent out to his dad. And for this letter, it's quite a lengthy letter and sometimes Stewart's handwriting is very jagged. So I'm sorry if I get like a couple of words wrong. And so the letter says this. Dear Dad, I know I'm probably the last person you want to hear from, but everything in the papers aren't true. They twist and make stuff up about what happened. I will explain everything in time, but put it this way. It was an accident, underlined. 
And I panicked. Stupid, I know. But for my stupidity, I am looking at 15 to 18 years. I regret it every second of every day, and there's nothing I can do about it. I think about taking my own life because if I did, underlined, someone will. That is definite. I am classified as a cat A, I believe it says. Cat A prisoner. Never thought this would happen. I hope you're not getting aggravated because of me. You know I'm not a bad person, everyone's saying. I can't sleep, can't eat. I wish I could turn back the clock, but I can't. And this is also underlined. I'm sorry to have lied to you all, but I didn't know what to do. End of underlining. I understand if you... I understand if you rip this up and never want to talk to me again. I wouldn't blame you. Kristen got arrested too. She had nothing to do with this. I loved her with all my heart and soul. God, I hate myself. I should have just gone about this a different way. Told the police everything. They're trying to say it was, and I don't know what that word is. I'm assuming it's a synonym to like on purpose. They're trying to say it was on purpose, but I promise you it wasn't. It was an accident, and I was a blank to do what I had done. If I had the chance, I would and have it now. I don't know what he means by that. I got no money, no blanks, no hope. It's the Hazel curse, and I only got myself to blame, and that will stick with me until my time comes, which wouldn't be long. I just want you to know I love you all. I know Kristen and family will never forgive me. I know what's coming and I deserve it. I want to ask you one favor and one favor only. Underlined. Send me a little bit of money and I will never ask of anything of you again. One mistake and my whole world has collapsed. My own fault, of course. But don't listen to the papers like everyone else does. I will tell you in time. I love you all. No doubt you will hear in the Old Bailey soon. Old Bailey was the courthouse that it was going to be held in. Tell Sarah and Mare and kids, I'm sorry, and mom and Darren and family. My God, have mercy on my soul, even though I don't deserve it. Love always your son, Stuart. I'm sorry. Truly, truly sorry. Like he had just been caught by murdering a 12-year-old girl and he still is trying to manipulate people into gaining sympathy for him. The whole letter, most of the time, he's talking about himself. He's talking about how he can't sleep, he can't eat, how he's so sorry, and how he needs money, which I thought that part was a little crazy. Like, how are you going to tell the family that you just killed their daughter, their granddaughter in the most horrific way possible and then had her body up in the attic for a week and pretend the entire time that you were trying to look for her and that you had no clue what was going on when in reality you killed her and then you have the audacity to ask them a favor and expect them to give you money and then right after that be like, but I don't deserve it. Gosh, I hate myself. And you know, if you, if you want to rip up this letter, I totally get it. No one likes me anyways. Yeah, no one does. You just killed a 12 year old girl. Of course, no one does. I feel like that letter alone really just tells you where Stuart's mind is at. He's only concerned about himself in this situation and the fact that he's getting 15 to 18 years. And nowhere in this letter does he show any sympathy or remorse. He, of course, says, I'm sorry, but he never says things like, I can't, you know, understand what you guys are going through through and you know like he just he shows no sympathy or like oh all of the money that's in my account give it to the family they deserve it more than me it's none of that it's all give me money because I feel so bad so then on May 7th of 2013 that is when Stewart's trial began and he pled not guilty 
Stuart pops up to the trial with a whole new story that no one has ever heard before and his story says that Thursday evening they had a nice evening together. They were just hanging out, playing board games, watching TV and then the following morning on Friday morning right before breakfast when Tia was coming down the stairs she accidentally fell down the stairs and snapped her neck and died. He said that he panicked and he didn't know how to tell Christine and Natalie that Tia was dead, so he panicked and hid the body in the attic. So that was the story that Stuart was going with. But the prosecutors, however, also had new stories and new evidence to debunk everything that Stuart is claiming. They said that when looking through Stuart's phone, they found a bunch of searches for incest porn in his search history indicating that there was an interest of that sort of nature. At the trial, they also showed the photos and videos that were found on the SD card. Since these were underage girls, they were blurred, but you definitely got the idea if you were there, um, proving that this crime was indeed done by Stuart. They also showed the two videos of Tia putting lotion on her legs, as well as Tia sleeping with Stuart's, clearly it's Stuart's, shadow on the wall, indicating a Again, that this was indeed Stuart's SD card and why would he create those videos or take those videos and then purposefully hide the SD card if he had nothing to hide. You know, obviously those are things that he didn't want anyone to see. Now, at this trial, the family of Tia was there, the grandmother, the mother, um, all of like their aunts and uncles. And from the reporters, they say that at times the family members had to leave the courtroom because they didn't want to see or hear all of the horrific things that Stuart had done. And especially when it came to the clearly little girl's body with um, black garbage bags all over her, at that point, the family just felt like they had seen enough, so they left the courtroom. And then on May 13th of 2013, that is when Stuart walked into the courtroom, and this was the day that Stuart was supposed to give his full story, take the stand, plead his innocence, and try to explain everything that had happened. But when Stuart walked into the courtroom that day, he ended up pleading guilty to Tia's murder, saying, quote, Tia's family has suffered enough. Now, a lot of people believe that Stuart did not plead guilty just because Tia's family has suffered enough. Frankly, it seemed like he didn't really care about the family. A lot of people just believe that Stuart most likely pled guilty uh, just so that he wouldn't have to get on the stand and have to embarrass himself in front of the whole court with all of his contradicting statements and all of the horrific things that he did. He would have to sit there and explain why there were those photos on the SD card and why he hid the body for a week. And he would have to basically confront all of those horrific details that he had been suppressing for so long. So instead of doing all of that, he he just pled guilty and moved on with it. And then the next day on May 14th of 2013, that is when the jury came to a verdict. And since Stuart Hazel was already pleading guilty, he was found guilty of the murder of 12-year-old Tia Sharp and was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 38 years. So he would not be eligible for parole until 2051 when he is 76 years old. And at the trial, the judge actually said something very interesting that I thought I would share with you right now. The judge said, quote, I come back to the question of whether I can be sure that sexual motivation was involved in Tia's murder. I have decided that it cannot. Sexual activity and conduct took place not long before her death, but in order for sexual motivation to be involved in her murder, there would need to be a closer connection than that. Or if Tia talked and spoke up and told someone about the incident. 
Both of these alternative possibilities could have been motives behind her killing. Because of the way you concealed her in the attic, the family were subjected to agony. Time after time, you spun a wholly false story that Tia had disappeared. I accept that none of your previous convictions were for serious violence. You have a psychiatric history of suicide attempts and self-harm. Your coping strategies were drugs and alcohol. None of these matters is an excuse for what you did to Tia, but they are matters which I can and do take into an account for the fixing of a minimum term. Basically, what the judge is trying to say, and it was an interesting angle that the judge, you know, was heading towards, but he says that he believes due to the explicit photos of children that was found on the SD card, he believes that there was um, a very pedophilic attraction towards um, Stuart to Tia, but he believes that sexual motivation was not the motivation for the murder. He believes that there was some sort of sexual interaction between Stuart and Tia, but him killing Tia was not for sexual matters. It was more because he couldn't handle with all of the shame and the guilt that came afterwards, and also the possibility that Tia will go home, tell her family about it, and then he would be kicked out of the house and out on the streets, and he couldn't bear the fact that he would be shunned and neglected from Natalie and Kristen, so his solution to make sure Tia didn't talk was to just kill her in general. General. So after killing her, he panicked and he put her body into the attic. And the reasoning why the judge gave him a minimum of 38 years is because he took into an account of uh, Stewart's rough upbringing, as well as his struggles with drugs and alcohol. He's in and out of jail all the time, so he feels like with the right amount of rehabilitation, he could really have a better outlook on life and really try to like get himself together while he's in jail. So that's what the judge had said, which I thought was kind of interesting because when you look at cases like these, you automatically assume that the reasoning for the murder was for sexual motivation, but in this case, it was the fear and the guilt that came afterwards that made Stewart do what he did. So the aftermath of this all, in 2013, uh, Tia's house, the one that she was killed, in was demolished and bulldozed down. In August 5th of 2013, that is when the next door neighbor, his name was Paul Meehan, the one that gave a false police report, um, he's the one who said that he saw Tia walking down the street to the train station. That was a completely false statement because they found Tia in the attic, meaning that she never left the house in the first place. So there would be no way for the neighbor to see Tia walking down the street if she never left the house. Now, I'm not really sure why the neighbor gave this false statement, but what I'm assuming is that Stuart told him to give this false statement because in Stuart's interview with ITV News, he kept on egging on the fact that, you know, I didn't do it. There's witnesses like my next door neighbor that say that they saw Tia walking down the street to go to the train station. So if she was walking alone, how could I have done this? And that was a point that Stuart kept on mentioning. So from my own perspective, I believe that uh, Stuart probably told the next door neighbor to do that. But unfortunately, since the neighbor complied and did do that, he ended up serving five months in jail for it. And then later on that year, on December 5th of 2013, it was announced that Kristen was cleared of all of her charges and she would not face charges for the murder of Tia Sharp, assuming that Stewart just did all of this on his own time and for his own self. 
And as far as 2022, I can't really find anything when it comes to the family or Stuart. Stuart is still in jail to this day. The birth father of Tia, Stephen Carter, he's actually married to another girl now that he's having a kid with soon. But he has spoken to the media a couple of times and he feels very guilty about not being there for Tia as a child. And he even, you know, goes on to say that he believes you know, all of this could be avoided if he was a present father in Tia's life. So that's where Stephen Carter is now. He still, you know, is making face to the public. And that's the most recent thing that I could find about the family. As far as today, they tend to live quite private lives, except for Natalia and Kristen, uh, the grandmother and the mother of Tia. They, a couple years ago, got arrested for racially aggravated assault. And that was the last thing I could find about them. As far as 2022, I can't really find anything about them. But yeah, so that is the end of today's case. If you found the story interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you are on YouTube or if you are on Spotify, Apple, wherever you can find podcasts, make sure to rate the podcast five stars because it really does help me out a lot. If you want to follow me on any of my socials like my Instagram, that will be linked down below as well as my PO box if you want to send me anything. And yeah, it's it's a very very terrible story. You know, it always hurts me so much when I have to, you know, research cases about such young people because Tia, like, she was 12 years old. That is 12, living on this earth for 12 years, that's, that's terrible. And her life was taken just so, so soon. And I can't even begin to imagine the pain and hurt that the family was going through through all of this and still to this day is going through because of the hands of Stuart Hazel. I hope that he stays in prison for the rest of his life and I hope he really feels the pain that the family feels knowing that they can never get Tia back. And so I feel like since the family can never have Tia back, then Stuart should never have his freedom back. I feel like that is, you know, equivalent and he should stay in jail for the rest of his life. And, you know, who's to say that if Stuart was released that he wouldn't offend again, you know? He had very explicit photos of underage girls. And I also thought that this case was very interesting when it came to the body language expert. I feel like the body language expert, Robert Phipps, he really opened up the case a lot and created a lot more breaks in the case and just tried to really hone down on the fact that Stewart was lying. I think that he contributed a lot to the case and I learned a bunch of things about, you know, body language analysis that I had no clue about before. Now, this was very odd to me and this is the last thing that I'll say because you know usually at the end of these cases I like to give my own thoughts and opinions because a lot of you guys you know write your own thoughts in the comments below but I thought it was very odd that Tia's body was found in the attic in plain sight and she had been there for an entire week and this was the fourth time the police were investigating the household so, in my head, it makes me think, what, what were they doing through those three other times when they had sniffer dogs and when they were tearing up the house through forensic searches? What exactly were they searching? Because you would think that, you know, you would probably look in every room of the house. You would look in every bedroom, the garage, the living room, the kitchen. You would probably strip that whole entire place down. And the attic is like, why wouldn't you go in the attic, you know? So that was very confusing to me, how this was the fourth time that they were deeply investigating this house, and yet none of those times they thought to just simply open up the hatch and walk into the attic. Because if they would have walked into the attic, they probably would have discovered the body a lot sooner than when they did. So that part was very odd to me, but yeah. So anyway, 
Again, if you guys, you know, researched about this case before and you, you know, know something that I didn't find in my research, make sure to leave that in the comments below. I love reading your guys' comments and do you guys think that Stuart should remain in jail or do you think he deserves a second chance at life? Again, let me know in the comments below your thoughts and your findings on this case. That is the end of today's video. Make sure to be safe out there. Um, I love you. I love you. I love you. Make sure to drink some water today. Go outside, get some sunlight, read a good book, and I will see you guys next week. Bye.